So this, this painting, uh, this is after Chimabue, and it's a rude, a rude screen. That's an English word, and it kind of transliterates to rod, and it means tree or root or cross, really. And the root is usually Jesus on the cross, the Virgin Mary, and John the Evangelist, unless it's also in Russia, it's John the Baptist. They kind of conflate them, the evangelist and the Baptist. So I found it really difficult to like those paintings from the 12th, 13th, 14th century. And uh, when the crucifix of Cimabue, which hung in the cathedral of Santa Croce in Florence from 1296 to 1966, and it got caught in that flood in Florence when the Arno overflowed, and it, the, the painting had hung over the main altar for, well, 300, 400 years. And the church was the parish church of Michelangelo and Dante and, and uh, Leonardo and Galileo and Goldone and quite a few quite a few people had prayed there as children in front of this crucifix. So I found it really cool that the, the painting by Chumabue had been the focus of the prayers of these greats, and I didn't like it. And so I went to the museum to see the ruined Chumabue after the flood. I was in school there. And the, the painting really caught me because half the face was missing, half the body was missing, the, it had been filled in with kind of beige paint. The Christ was maybe uh, 10 or 12 feet tall. It's enormous. And the missing face with the sad eyes was just overwhelmingly powerful. And I found it really moving me to prayer. And so I did this painting, the, the three kind of arched canvases. I found them at the art supply store and I fell in love with the shape. And so I, I bought them and eventually painted this painting of the three figures. And it hung in the chapel for 10 months over the baptistry. And I remember a Japanese Jesuit visiting and saying he really loved the Madonna and he really, really wanted to take it home to Japan uh, for his parish that he was working in. But he left before we could negotiate that. <laughs> But then when it came down, I decided the figure needed to be bigger. But when I painted it, each of the halos, I was, you know, in Byzantine painting, you always write the, the painting. You don't really paint the painting. And it has to do with praying, it, making the painting as a prayer. And so I actually wrote in the halos of these three, the, the behind the Virgin, I wrote the names of beloved women who were dead and behind the, no, beloved women who were alive. And behind St. John, there were beloved men who were alive. And behind the Christ, there were beloved men and women who were dead. And then I painted them out with the, the gold. Uh, eventually, many of the people in the two living halos are dead and joined the others, so it's really, it becomes for me a symbol of how Christ descends into our world and decomposes with us. He enters into our entropy like he enters into humanity and dies with us. He dies with us as paintings that have been glorious for 500 years die. He dies with them too. There's something about that that I don't believe is a fact, but it's a myth. It's it's something in my own painting that speaks to me of how Christ tells us God loves us, loves us enough to die with us and promises us something beyond, something we don't know, we just have faith in. And that's what the painting is kind of about. So I feel, eventually, I feel pretty good about this painting and I find myself taught by it to love the paintings of Cimabue and Giotto and Duccio, those great painters of the Italian, the early Italian Renaissance. 
This, this painting is uh, after a painter named Rublev, Andrei Rublev, who was a Byzantine painter kind of in the style and the period, but not the time zone, of Cimabue. He painted uh, paintings for the imperial chapels inside the Kremlin. And one of his most famous paintings is of the three angels visiting Abraham and Sarah at Mamre, by the Oak of Mamre, outside their tent. And in the painting, he gets more Russian and more Byzantine at the same time. The three angels are dressed in this painting, even more than in his, in red, yellow, and blue, the breakup of light. Russians considered that the first appearance of the Holy Trinity in Genesis, when the three angels appear to Abraham and tell him he's going to have a son and that he'll be the father of many nations. And Sarah, laughing in the tent, um, because she's too old to have children, the angels hear her and say, uh, you may laugh now, Sarah, but mark my words, next year at this time you'll be holding an infant in your arms. So Abraham is the host on the ground here, looking like a frog, and Sarah is in the background. They're both really little, like in Byzantine paintings, and the angels and the table roll off kilter because they, as soon as they're involved, it's heaven. And when we're involved, we're just little. <laughs> and, but their tent becomes kind of the, the image of the church. And the oak, I think it's like something like the, um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from the Garden of Eden that somehow because of the arrival of the Trinity to speak to us ever is an indication that all the guilt is forgotten. Cool? Uh, yes, very cool. Here the, the guy in the middle is blessing the bread and wine. <laughs>